So, Bob, as usual, people write in questions that they want you and I to answer. So I thought we would read those questions and answer them. What do you say, Bob? I say, let's read the questions and then they'll do the answering. <laughs> this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Bob? I'm Bob Gettle, friend from graduate school and a therapist in practice in Seattle, and apparently the new owner of a fan club. <laughs> Patron, famous patron Emily made a, a fan club pin or a magnet, and we might be stealing that idea for some merch coming up. So if, if you're interested in merch and you want a Bob fan club magnet, watch out for that. Stacy, my wife, is working on various different uh, ways of even delivering the merch to everyone, but also different designs and this kind of thing. It was completely flattering. Yeah. Does Emily know that you sent it to me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, well, she wanted, you know, she wanted you oh. to have it. Yeah. Well, she, thank she you, Emily. It was totally flattering and really fun. And Colleen, uh, Colleen actually has custody of it, so <laughs> I get to see, I get to visit it. <laughs> and your quote is something like, "It's all about love" or something. Love is the cure. Love is the cure. That's right. Yeah. Which is so, really Freud, not me. So Kate from Ireland wrote in and has a very interesting email, Bob, that I want to know your opinion about. So this is about inappropriate behavior from my therapist, she writes. After a traumatic incident, I saw a counselor at my university. At first, she was really helpful and I thought I was gaining a lot from it. But in the last year, I have been put off, I have been putting off therapy because of some of her behavior. For example, she has forgot my name multiple times. She takes phone calls during appointments and sometimes argues with people on the phone. She suggested I drink alcohol before sex and wear provocative clothes to get over my anxiety around sex, even though I was sexually assaulted while drunk. She's never made she's she's never on time for our appointments. She has sometimes completely not even shown up for our appointments. She has forgotten why I am even there and asking me to retell my traumas to her so she can, quote unquote, figure out who I am again, unquote, over and over again, which is difficult for me to do. There are very limited counseling opportunities in my college, so I don't have any other option, I think. Or maybe I should just give up on counseling. Bob, what do you think? That description is appalling. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's almost... It's like one of those truth is stranger than fiction, hard to believe, though I totally believe it, but like just absurdly awful. I mean, my God. Yeah. I, 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 my first hit was, is this counseling doing you any good? Because if it's not doing any good and it's hurting you, then you should stop. Yeah. And the level of mm, mm, unethical behavior and really just impolite behavior on the part of your therapist makes me think that they're not workable. Yeah. I might be wrong about that. I'm in favor of people talking to their counselor. I think that talking to your counselor about these things can be a great way to shape the person up and also can be extraordinarily, extraordinarily useful and good for your own self-image, your own self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Super appalling. And the first thing I thought of when I read this email was I've trained a lot of therapists and I have rarely come across individuals who are like this. It, there's just a certain percentage of people or therapists who will do this sort of thing. The other thing I thought was, what, I, I don't know if in Forrest Gump, stupid is as stupid does, I don't really know what that phrase means. I don't think I ever knew what it meant. Do you know what it means? I have no fucking idea what that means. Yeah. Um, but for for me, I, I've always interpreted it as y you, you aren't a stupid person. You're only stupid for your behavior. And it's mainly, it's mainly your choices in life that define stupidity, so to speak. I think that was the lesson. It's it's like is Forrest Gump stupid because he was called stupid a lot. Stupid is as stupid does. It's it's not it's not like how smart you are on a test. It's what the choices you make. You know, do you make stupid choices? And the other way I I, I interpret that phrase. I don't know if it's 
uh, accurate or not is that when people do stupid things, they tend to do many stupid things. And, and I see this in, in therapists, not only in the very rare individual that I end up having to gatekeep out of the program or out of the field, but also in ethical case studies. When you hear about these people who get sued successfully, it's rarely one behavior that got them in trouble. It's a suite of behaviors that they got caught for and you through their the case study you think oh they must have been doing this in all sorts of scenarios so yeah let's just review stupid as a stupid does from this therapist that that kate has forgotten her so let's just walk through the each each line here so forgotten the client's name now i'll say from the start that i've i'm not that good with names but i i haven't forgotten a client name if I've seen them for a, a, a while, you know, if I've, because she says in the last year, so I, I suspect this has been at least a couple years. So I would never forget someone's name beyond that. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not that great with names. In the beginning of therapy, though, I'm terrible with names. And I, uh, I don't know what it is about me in the beginning, but, but I've known that about myself and the way that I adjust for it is I keep their file right next to me on a little table. And before I, even if I'm pretty sure about their names, I glance at my file to kind of make sure that I, I get their first name right. Uh, so, and sometimes, you know, I'm treating whole families. There's like five people in the room and sometimes, you know, I have to glance over at that. But so on, on one level, it's like normal, but on another level, it, when you take it with all the other behaviors, it all kind of makes sense. But Bob, have you ever forgotten a client's name? Yeah, about two months ago. What happened? This, this, I'm, I'm seeing this couple, not for couple counseling, we'll get into the details, and I called him Steve. <laughs> his name is not Steve. It's not even close. <laughs> it's not like his name is Scott. It's not even close. It was so far off the mark. And he says to me, who's Steve? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, I forgot your name, didn't I? Yeah, and he to he reminded me what his name was. But before he said it, before before I said Steve, I kept trying to look down at my file like, what's this guy's name? What's this guy's name? And I couldn't see my file. I keep it in a box, and it's turned away from clients so that they can't see other people's names when they're in session with me. And um, it was turned away from me, too. I couldn't quite see his name, so I didn't want to be distracted. Like, oh, hey, give me a thought there. You know, and I just, I'm like, I think it's Steve. So I took a shot in the dark. <laughs> I was dead wrong. I, I, I was horrified. Yeah. I apologized, of course. Well, so the other thing, the other question is, did you have to say his name? No. Yeah. So it, it's not very frequent that we as therapists have to say people's names, yeah. unless it's in, you know, uh, conjoint therapy where there's more than one person. Right. Uh, so if if there's Jane and John, I, I especially over the phone, I'm finding that I because I do a lot of sessions now with the phone, and so I. Usually, I would look to that person, but you know now I have to call people out by right. name. Right. And uh, but there isn't very many times. So it, I, I've been there before too, where I I say the name and then I get it wrong, or I mm -hmm. stumble on the name and it mm -hmm. and it's clear I wasn't quite sure. Mm -hmm. And then I think, as a therapist, I don't have to say their name. I could have just said, "Hey, you," <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, one of my, uh, you know, Paul David, my yeah. my old mentor from yeah. the university, he would, uh, he he knew a lot of people. He was program director, and so there was a lot of people that he knew, and he would bump into that. Let's just say on the campus, a lot of people knew him, and he didn't know very many people. And he was in this habit. I noticed. I never asked him about this, but I always suspected he would call everyone guy. Or every guy, every everyone who looked like a guy, he called guy. Yeah, including me. Uh -huh. Like even though him and I knew each other extremely well, you know, we we knew each other very well, and I would assume he would know my name because we would have one-on-one -on -one sort of interactions throughout the week. And anyway, yeah, so we'd bump into each other in the hallway, and he'd say, "Hey, guy," and I always thought like, I think he just ref he just learned. Look, it's better to say guy than to take a chance and uh, miss someone's name. I also, uh, Stacy has a relative, I think maybe her grandpa or someone. 
he called everyone Mike. <laughs> he called it every every guy Mike. <laughs> 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 that's a riot hey mike hey mike. how's it going mike <laughs> probably for the same reason but anyway yeah so so it, it is a thing that therapists will do especially when you have full caseloads if you especially if you're at an agency or a university clinic where you might have 50 to 100 clients it it, it you know it if that in isolation uh, is that if, yeah. that if that's the only thing like with S- S- aka steve I'm guessing you have a good enough. Well, what what did you do to repair that minor rupture? I said I was sorry, and then he called me. He's like, "Oh, no problem, Phil." <laughs> <laughs> and then the other day, I saw them uh, last Tuesday, and the other day, uh, I said, and we were talking about something or whatever. And I'm like, and you know, remember that time I called you, Steve? And we just had a laugh about it. And yeah, yeah, I have this thing though. You know, ever since I just got out of graduate school. When I'm writing for an appointment, I use a paper calendar still. And when I'm writing down for the next week, who's, you know, like, I'm just seeing this client. Let's say maybe his name's Carol. So I'm seeing Carol. And then next week we're scheduling our appointment. And I stare at the time block on my calendar and I can never remember the name. And it's because I got triggered when I was young and just starting out where I was seeing a client and I was scheduling an appointment and I drew a blank on her name and she's standing there next to me and she caught it and she smiled at me and she said, it's, and then she said her name. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. And right, ever right. since then, when I'm scheduling a client, my heart rate goes up a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, so I was having a hard time following you. I don't know if it's just yeah. me, but just to, in case people are having a hard time. So at the end of us, and I used to keep a paper calendar, yeah. actually the same uh, at a glance, I think that you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end of a session, you pull out your calendar and you say, okay, how about next Wednesday at five o'clock? And the client says, yep. And then basically right in front of them, you write, but they can't exactly see what you're writing, but they write you kind of, they see you scribble something on your calendar. And there are times when you forget in the moment, wait, what is this client's name? And you, you skip a beat. And if you skip a beat too long, the client is looking at you going, yes. I bet you he just forgot who, my name. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. This I, happens to me twice a week. Really? Yeah. yeah for yeah. 20 years. Yeah. I'm, now, tell me if which one it is. Are you bad with names or because of the trauma of oh. being called out, you get so in your head that you oh. can't? Yeah. It's yeah. the second one. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with names and, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. It, so I, I, it's been a while since I have used a paper uh, a calendar, but I, right. I, the rare times when that would happen, I would just very quickly write, like, I'd get like a microsecond of crap. I don't remember the name. Okay, great. And I close my calendar and, and move on. And then later I'd go back and put in the name. <laughs> right. 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 Oh, good cover. Now, now the thing is to people who might worry about like, wait, does my client or does my therapist forget my name? The thing is, is that the, in other relationships, names are very important. Like when you work with someone or they are, I don't know, one of the students in your class, it's extremely important because you ha- like with my students, for example, I have say 10 students in a class. Well, when they turn in their papers, I have to be able to identify who turned in that paper. When I call on someone in class, when I refer to someone, you know, when Jane said this, blah, blah, blah. With clients, names almost never come up, especially in individual therapy. The other people's names, like the names of their spouses or their kids or their coworkers, but the name of the client, because you're never going to say, uh, Jane, listen to me right now. Like you, you, you don't. It, it is a. It was a rare circumstance where Bob even said Steve. So th- it's it, it's not inconceivable to have a very deep relationship with your client and know a lot about them, but not have a very firm grasp on their name, so to speak. Yeah, there might be a little uh, slippery spot there. Yeah, it's not like you don't know who they are. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Now you know what I, I do? What? When I'm, when I'm writing the name and it happens these days, I take a guess. And I start it either with a curvy letter or a straight line letter. And then I'm like, okay, is that the right? 
Is that the right shape? Of <laughs> does what if it's a couple? Does one of them have that start with a straight line letter? Because that's what I started with. And sometimes I'm like, nope, nope. That 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 was Vince. <laughs> okay, so so solution, Bob. Yeah. Every client that walks in, write uh, you know my name is, and then write you know Steve, and then put it on their put fore- on the- <laughs> forehead, and then you'll never forget. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So. So the other thing here is uh, other behaviors is... Oh, my God. She takes phone calls during appointments and sometimes argues with people. <laughs> now, uh, I have seen this before. I, mm-hmm. I did co-therapy with another family therapist. I'll, I, I've told this story in the podcast before. I, I'll never forget it. It was a big family. And so me and another therapist, you know, the other family therapist were helping this family out. And this was when cell phones were first kind of coming out. It was, it was during the flip phone days, if that makes any uh, historical reference to people. And her, first her phone rings, which I found to be abhorrent because I would always silence my phone before going into session. And, I th- and her phone rings and I turned to her and I thought, oh my God, she's gonna be so embarrassed that her phone is even on. And, and she, didn't look, she didn't look embarrassed. And then she proceeds to pull out her phone. I think, oh, well, she's going to turn it off. And then she answers the phone. So there's seven family members, me, the therapist, we're in the middle of something. And she answers the phone. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, she's just going to say, sorry, I got to go. And then proceeds to have, you know, maybe a 30-second conversation like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah da, 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 blah, blah, blah. I couldn't believe it. And how someone could be so oblivious. Now, there's not a lot of explicit talk about this, right? It's, but it, it's such a commonsensical idea that you, but anyway, so have you ever seen this sort of thing, Bob? Yeah, the other night I was looking on uh, the internet and they had a thing on, you know, funny Saturday Night Live sketches where the actors break up laughing and they did this whole thing where Will Ferrell's a doctor and the, his two patients are coming in and he doesn't know who the hell they are. And then the phone rings and he's talking to Beverly and he's like, yeah, I've got these patients in front of me. Yeah, they're a real pain in the ass and this kind of shit right around there. Like, we can hear you. And he's like, oh, now they're complaining that they can hear me, right? And it's comical. Yeah. It's absurd. And this therapist is really doing that. And if I heard, if I heard right, multiple times. Yeah. Fuck, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to think what would be going on with someone that that would be the case. That, you know, are they impaired somehow? Are they, uh, are they drunk? Yeah. Are, are they... Uh, losing their marbles in a certain way. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, what is going on with that? Um, why would you take phone calls? Like, what What would be the, the point of that? I mean, even taking a phone call while you're talking to somebody is, is rude. It's rude. Yeah, let alone in a therapy session. And I, I want to be clear to any clients out there who are wondering about this, this is abhorrent behavior taking a phone call in the middle of a therapy session therapy sessions are sacred space spaces even for people who don't really go for that vibe as a therapist even if you're a real nuts and bolts cognitive behavioral therapist you would never take a phone call in the middle of a session so this is this is very very strange behavior and then arguing with people in the middle of session she also goes on uh, so I, she says, you know, I was sexually assaulted while drunk, and I, I'm I've been having anxiety around having sex, and she suggested I drink alcohol before sex and wear provocative clothing. So, this one I would want more context around. It sounds very awful, and if the client is walking away with this message, then obviously the therapist failed. But I would want to know, because I've, I've heard other kinds of accusations on therapists before along these lines where they enter into, say, a three-session conversation about sexuality, and a lot of things are talked about, 
and the client walks away with this notion that is a highlighted difficult moment among three hours of, of talking and so I'd want to know more but again given all that we've heard so far it wouldn't be hard for me to believe that this therapist is so inept that they not you know not only missing you know you don't remember the client's name you take phone calls it's it wouldn't be hard to believe that this therapist would be so inept that they would recommend to someone who has been through sexual trauma that they get drunk before sex and wear provocative clothing to get over their anxiety. Uh, so, and then she also says, she's never on time for our appointments and she has completely not shown up for appointments. So again, this is abhorrent. Now, I this one I hear, uh, especially the not showing up on time. And the, let me just get angry about this as I usually do. The, there are two types of people in the world. There are people who are on time and there are people who are late. Me and my wife are on time people, meaning we're early. And if we're on time, that means we're late. If we have a thing, we are out the door well in advance and we're always 15 minutes early, if not earlier than that. And then there are late people who are always late and we all know those people. Bob is an on-time person. Other people can be late people, and we know those people. They, they're they always late. And if they're on time, you're like, what? You're surprised. You're like, how, what, what did you think? It? And, and often with my people who are always late when they're on time, they got the time wrong and they thought they were an hour late. <laughs> I'm not even joking. And, and so, uh, so what I say is that's fine. You know, in the regular world, that's fine. There are on-time people and there are late people. And if you want to be, and, and the thing is, is late people, they always have excuses. Oh, well, you know, traffic. Look, I'm an on-time person. I understand the concept of traffic. <laughs> you live here. You have to. Well, it's not like traffic was invented that day that that person <laughs> was late. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, oh, uh, you know. Uh, I'm late today because, you know, uh, there was wind drag on my car. It's like uh, there's always been these forces of nature that have, uh, you know, tried to throw a wrench into your being on time. And guess what? People who are on time are always on time. Now, in this, in the regular world, fine. You know, make your excuses, be in denial, whatever. Annoy the fuck out of me and all the other on-time people. Or, you know, or at least be consistently always late in the same amount. So we invite you an hour early and then you show up late, but just really on time. Anyway, fine. But if you're a therapist, F off, that S has got to end. <laughs> you are no longer a regular citizen anymore. You are now in charge and responsible for people's mental wellness. And if you're one of those late people, that has got to to stop. When you are even one minute late, one second late for a session, that hurts your clients. Clients can be late. That's up to them. But you cannot. And get your S together. Again, if you're a therapist, you have 30, point, 30 you know, standing appointments every, every week. You would think you would have ironed out any kind of wrinkles in your system about being on time. The other thing is, is that it's not like you're showing up for different appointments all over town. You just have to be in your stupid office. So it's not like, you know, get to your office an hour early before your first appointment and just wait, you know, just, just wait. Now, if you have some kind of medical issue that requires going to the bathroom, whatever, that's and makes you late for your appointments, talk to your clients, make sure it's not, those are uh, obviously excusable incidences, but that's not usually the case. Um, I would say to someone, if they were a supervisee of mine, I would say, well, it's better to end a, a session early because you have a medical emergency than to, than to show up late for one. 
So you could say to a client, look, I have to end early. I got to get to the bathroom, blah, 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 and then show up on time for the next appointment. Anyway, this drives me bonkers. You think? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's such a simple thing. And mm. it's a litmus test, right? If you are so inept and so uncaring and so unaware and so chaotic and so impaired that you can't show up on time consistently to your appointments, there is likely a whole suite of harms that you are doing to all of your clients. I don't care how nice you are. I had a, um, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, who had a therapist that was very much like this, who was never on time. And mm. the therapist uh, practiced out of her home. So she didn't even have to. So, so my colleague, friend, would show up to this therapist's home and actually uh, the clients could walk in to the appointment room. And so the client, so she just walked in to the appointment room, sits down. She can hear her therapist walking around upstairs because she knew that, you know, she knows that her therapist lives alone in this house and 20 minutes pass. And she's just like, should I go up there and remind her? And this happened many, many times. And it just, it's just, uh, I just don't understand. It, it, it boggles the brain at the very least show up to your appointments therapist you know it's now I will say that drug addiction is a thing and substance addiction is a thing and when you have a problem uh, it, it, it tends to take its toll on a variety of areas including this and so it makes me wonder about that I was my first thought to, is that maybe this person's impaired by drug addiction yeah so there's that. Now, that doesn't excuse it at any No, point. no. It just, but it does it kind of explain it. And the, the last one here is, mm. she has forgotten why I'm even there asking me to retell my traumas to her so she can figure out again who I am over and over again, which is difficult to do. So not only is this discounting, obviously, to the client, but it's also making a client retell their traumas over and over again <laughs> without any knowledge. I mean, it's, it's just... It's causing harm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just awful. After more than two years, or at least more than a year, uh, you know, and it, it sounds like this therapist has this thing that she says, like, wait, um, tell me again uh, your backstory, because I, I need to figure out who you are again. This sounds like she has that phrase at the go. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, this is pretty awful. Yeah. Um, now, I will s go back to the beginning of Kate's email and say, at first, she was really helpful, and I thought I was gaining a lot from it. So she did get something out of it in the beginning, mm -hmm. which says something. Yeah. But as you said, Bob, if you're not getting anything out of it now, and it's not actually helping you, then maybe and, it, it's time to uh, jump ship. Especially if it's hurting you. Yeah. Now, the other thing they say here is there's very limited counseling opportunities in my college, yeah. so I don't have any other option. Right. Yeah, and this is a problem uh, around the world. Uh, some communities have it worse off than others, but it is kind of a problem. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, if you hate Burger King, then you can go to McDonald's right across the street. If you, right. if you don't like Seattle's best, then you just go to Starbucks. And there, there's, it's just easy. You just walk across the street when it comes to therapy, we live in a world that just has a completely weird, you, you, it's almost like every therapist is their own speakeasy or something. Like you, you have to know someone who knows someone with the secret knock to get into, maybe you'll be let in, but the therapist probably is all full anyway. Mm -hmm. And then it's back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. and, and you're just like, well, how do we live in a world like that? Right. It's just a strange, uh, you know, thing. When I have a problem, if I broke my foot, I would be matched up with the perfect physician within seconds, minutes. I'd call my uh, insurance. I'd be like, I just broke my foot. And they'd send me to a podiatrist, right? Is that the foot doctor? And yeah. uh, that would be the thing. But you have a problem with sexual trauma, and it's like, well, you know, Here's some names. Maybe these therapists know. They claim that they're good enough with trauma, but that's a shot in the dark. And 
maybe they have space open for you and maybe they're not impaired. We don't know. You have to shop around. Imagine having to shop around for a podiatrist the way that we tell people they have to shop around for a therapist, you know? Imagine having, I mean, obviously part of it just has to do with the fact that therapy is highly personal and a relationship fit and all that kind of stuff. But, but just even getting a chance to try that out anyway. Any last words to well, Kate from Ireland? Given that um, in the present day, we're doing a lot of telehealth, um, that might open some doors because like I was not open to telehealth till COVID hit. And now I'm like, I've discovered uh, surprisingly that telehealth actually works okay. You know, and, and it's not a barrier the way I thought it would be. It wouldn't be my preference. And so when the virus stops, I might, I prepare, I'm plan to go back to my office and see people in my room, but I can't say that I'm going to hold that as rigidly as I have in the past. So I wonder if for uh, this patron writing in, if maybe they could explore um, telehealth options that are outside their community. Uh, probably got a better bit cast a wider net. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And people out there, uh, if you're a therapist that has room, make sure you do a good job advertising yourself because there are people out there needing you. Hey, can I just air one of my pet peeves? Yeah, please. What the hell is the deal with therapists not returning calls to prospective clients? Yeah. Like really good therapists don't return calls to prospective clients. They have that thing on their voicemail that says, you know, my practice is full, which, okay, I get. I get you'd want to put that so that you can cut down on, maybe cut down on having to be responsive. But I've been a client and called around for therapists and not received any kind of response and it stings. Yeah. And so now, like for the third time in my life, I actually don't have any openings to take clients. It's all subject to change. It could change next week, next month. Um, that's what's happened before. But when I get a call or an email, I respond within, usually that day, within 24 hours, and occasionally I fuck up. And when I fuck up and forget, I always say, you know what, I'm sorry. I, wait, I took this long to return your call because I recognize. And now when people call me and they're looking for a therapist and I'm referring them around, I say, look, I know it sucks. I know it sucks, but you, you can call more than once and you might have to because even the good ones who are very responsive once you're working together are shit at returning phone calls. I, I don't understand how people in our profession can be that blindly insensitive. Yeah. You know, like people choose this field because they care, right? Well, how about caring about somebody that rings you up because they're in pain? Yeah. Nobody calls therapists when their life's going great. Right. They call when they're, anyways. So therapists out there, return your fucking phone calls. Yeah. Do people a favor. Just yeah. be decent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is going to sound like I'm bragging, but uh -huh. I've been, you know, I have a certain amount of notoriety on the internet. And so people reach out to me a lot for the, yeah. for, uh, to hire me and, and I have an extremely small practice. And so I haven't accepted new clients in years. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I've been turning people down for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and lately I've been getting multiple requests every day. And guess what? I respond to every, every single one. Yeah. I tell it and, and I don't got time for that, but I do it. Because yeah. it's just a common courtesy, you know. It's a courtesy. They might, they might just, they might wait for a month. Going well, is that person going to call me back? You, you might be the only person that they're calling. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog. Uh, he's getting upset about this too right now. Yeah. Can you hear? Can Kenobi you hear? calls back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you just sent me somebody, or you just referred two people to me in the last couple of days. Um, I, I. To be perfectly candid, I do forget sometimes, and it's two days later or three days later. And whenever that happens, I feel awful about it. Yeah. Because they were in pain on Monday, and I'm, it's Thursday? What the hell, man? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the only thing I can really think of as to why people do this is yeah. because it's, it's, all, it's like 99% of therapists do this. Yeah. Uh, and why would so many people do this? And, and the thing I can think of is, one they assume that the person is calling a whole bunch of people, which might not be true. And even if it was, that yeah. doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing is that 
therap- uh, there's a lot of therapists who are very out of control of their lives, I find. They're, they, have very, they have a lot of chaos and disorganization. And they, you know, their life is like a very cluttered desk. And so, <laughs> they're, and they're, so they, there's a lot of things on their desk that they need to get to. And in their mind, they're thinking, oh, I'm going to call that person back. I'm going to do that. But there's all these, this other clutter that kind of sh- overshadows it. Yeah. And, then, and then a couple weeks go by. And they're like, oh, I should call that person back. Oh, it's been a couple of weeks. I mean, what's what? I'm sure they've moved on. That it's weird to call someone like, you know, 15 days later and saying, oh, sorry, my practice is full. That just yeah. that just feels weird. Yeah. And then they and then they just don't do it. And uh, I, it's just not acceptable. You know, I I'm an extremely organized person. <laughs> I'm an ex- I'm extremely on time. Uh, I. I, again, it sounds like I'm bragging, and and I guess I am on a certain level, uh, but I, so it's very. I, the, I'm saying two things. One is is that it's easy for me to do these kinds of things because I just have a. I, I'm just extremely anal about having things be in be orderly. You know, the example I always give is uh, when I have groceries. You know, you go to the store and you buy like a whole whole bunch of groceries, and they're in your car. And in my head, I do a calculation about the fewest amount of trips I can do from my car to my house. Like, okay, how can I, oh. how can I engineer mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. so that I only have to do, you know, three trips right. instead, of, instead of four trips, which is really <laughs> kind of silly when you think about it. Mm-hmm. it. It just, it's another 15 seconds mm-hmm. and probably less likelihood of like spilling crap everywhere. And you know when you're you're carrying like eight bags on one arm and it's just digging into your oh, wrist. Yeah. Uh, but that's just how I live, for better or for worse. There's pros and cons, so it's kind of easy for me to do it. But the other thing is, is I just value the benefits of not being chaotic in my life. Now I have certain privileges that allow me to to be non-chaotic, I suppose. But but at the same time, it. If you are conscientious, you think ahead, you're proactive, and you spend the time, you can actually eliminate a lot of the downsides of chaos. Another example I always give is when I get a bill in the mail, I pay it right then and there. Like, I I don't put it in a pile to pay later. Now, again, that's a privilege that I can pay it in that moment. So if that's an issue, then obviously that's not an option. But but if it's just a, a chore, like, oh, it's just the water bill that I just pay every month, I pay it right away. Because in my head, now I'm not saying everyone needs to do this, but, I'm, but for me, I'm just thinking if a, that and the hundred other things I do in a day, if I, if I put it off, that's another five seconds per issue that I have to address later on. Whereas if I just do it right now, and I, and I don't want to do it right now, but if I do it right now, then it's off my table. I don't have to think about it. Uh, that I don't have to look at a pile of crap that I have to deal with. I just, I just deal with it in this very moment. And I know other people are out there are like me. Now, you, if you're a regular citizen and you're not, and you're, the cons of your chaos do not affect other people, then great. But if you're a therapist, the cons of your chaos will probably affect your clients. And that stuff has got to end, at least in the realm of you being a therapist. Um, I know really good therapists that are highly, highly responsive to clients that are already on their caseload. And, you know, great. Like, call them up anytime. Like, they, that's the kind of availability they, they um, believe is ethical and proper. Which, you know, great. Everybody's got their limits around that. Who don't return phone calls to prospective clients. Why do you think they don't do that? I, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, maybe they redline. You know, like um, uh, they fill their cup to the brim with the various bits of life, work, home, whatever it is that people do with their time, and they run it right to the edge. So I take as many clients as I can, maybe even a little more than I can handle, and I get involved in activities with my family, maybe even slightly more than I can handle, and my schedule is overpacked, and who's going to get the short end is, you know, someone I don't know. 
is probably going to get the short end. Maybe they, uh, I wonder if maybe people redline like that. I was also thinking that if things don't work out uh, with our respective wives, maybe you could marry me because I'm like that too. <laughs> Colleen's not like that? No, she is. She's very organized. Oh. Uh, very organized. I was just saying that um, I pay my bills as soon as they come in. I don't let that shit go. Yeah. I'm like you. And yeah, I yeah. do that whole how many bags, how many trips to the <laughs> kitchen from the car thing every time I go out to the grocery store. and. <laughs> yeah, Anyways. well, I mean, we're already kind of married in a certain sense, I suppose. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I, yeah. so I, to be clear, I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is that a part of me just really enjoys it, but a part sure. of me does this out of compassion yeah. for how my chaos right. affects other people. Right. And the less chaotic you are, which mm. takes doing, it's not, I mean, Bob can, Bob's known me long enough to know me during a time when the homes I lived in were not clean exactly. <laughs> the, uh, when I lived in Wallingford, for example. Oh, yeah, great apartment. That, it's not like that place was filthy, but it wasn't like it was clean. And I just worked on it. since. That was when I was in my 20s. And now I'm very clean. Yesterday, I did a full scrub down in the in the bathroom and in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, lots of bleach and whatnot. Uh, my wife came downstairs and was just like, ah, oh, what's all this smell? And I'm like, that's the smell of clean. Yeah. And I wasn't like that before. I, but why am I like that now? Well, yeah. because I would practice out of my home. And yeah. when I looked in my bathroom, right. which my clients would go into, I was mortified. And so I, I changed. Right. I changed. Yeah. I was a chaotic, gross, yeah. dirty mess as a 19 year old and as time has gone on i have changed and i'm more organized more clean more conscientious less chaotic why because people depend on me and if you're a therapist people depend on you and so get your ass together you know um first off I lived part time in that apartment when you were there. <laughs> and it every was every as, Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. Usually late night pizza. Um, uh, you used to cook the Red Baron cheese pizza with Tabasco sauce on it. Oh, that was oh so good. yeah, that was so yeah. Good. It was like three cheese pizza. Oh, or something. so good. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the one. Anyways, uh, not that bad. Kirk's apartment, you know, not that bad. Any, and I um, am not actually an organized person. Like, left to my own devices, my garage is shit. It's like chaotic mess. And the garage is a room that Colleen doesn't use, right? My nightstand is a table, the one table in my house that um, is mine, and Colleen doesn't use it, and it is stacked with garbage. Not garbage, but, you know, just papers and stuff and bits that I don't feel like dealing with. I do not fold laundry when I'm single. It sits in a pile. It gets wrinkled. I like it folded. I prefer it folded, but I hate folding laundry. And left to my own devices, I don't fold it. I wouldn't wash dishes regular. Well, dishes, I'm probably pretty. Anyways, I do that shit because Colleen's in the house. She likes folded laundry, so I fold laundry. And then I get the benefit of folding laundry, folded laundry, because I've done it. But um, it's accountability to others. That's what makes me clean the house and cook food and fold laundry and keep the house neat, except in those two free spaces that I have, the garage and So are you talking about the nightstand by your bed? Yeah. There's papers on the oh, nightstand? Oh, dude. It's why, papers. Why would there be papers? Like, uh, uh, like I have to go over and check. Like it's forms? Bills. There's a pad. There's, oh, oh, no, it's receipts. <laughs> <laughs> on the nightstand of next to your yeah. bed. Receipts. Because, you know, uh, uh, we have a home business and... Um, uh, I keep the receipts for that, but I don't keep them in a very organized way. And they kind of pile up there. Eventually, Colleen got so sick of it, she just grabbed an envelope and she shoved them all in there. And she's like, you can deal with them some other time, but at least I don't got to look at them, you know. And um, yeah, yeah, it's mostly. And then there's like odds and ends. There's uh, my my book and a folder. And then there's my cup. And then there's my coaster and my cords to plug my phone in. And... Uh, Paper. I don't remember what it is. I, I, I don't even keep track of that shit. I don't know what's there. It, mm -hmm. But it is my free space. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the house is common space. And so I generally keep it up because 
it's not fair to Colleen to have to look at all that shit. She don't like it. And I actually prefer it cleaned up. Yeah. I just don't do it when left to my own devices. Yeah. So I guess my point is that um, accountability is what makes me uh, change my behavior. You're accountable to your clients, wanting them to feel good when they come into your house and use your bathroom. Yeah, makes sense. You keep it clean. And without that, you might revert. But it's the same with the phone calls. Like, yeah. I feel a sense of accountability to people that ring me up. Yeah. I feel like they, they deserve um, folded laundry, if that's a way to put it. Yeah, and it, I think that it is, a, 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 we are accountable because of empathy and professional mm-hmm. responsibility. Right. That if you your practice is full, that you have some names of people who aren't full. Right. Uh, if, if it's hard to find those names, ask around, or at least put effort into that. When I when people call me, and they ask for a therapist, I feel terrible if I was just like, nope, sorry. But I always yeah. have names. Now I have the luxury of knowing a lot of novice therapists who are building their practices. They're right. supervisees of mine. Right. Uh, but uh, but you know if you don't have the luxury, then reach out to someone who does. And 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 you know maybe it's. Once every three months, you reach out right. to that colleague of yours who has a line on a lot of novice therapists, right. and you update your list. Not that hard to do. Um, the reason why we need to do this is because clients have no other recourse. There's, there's, it's not easy. <laughs> so it, it's not like walking across the street to the Starbucks as opposed to the Seattle's Best or vice versa. It, there are many people like Kate from Ireland who are dealing with a bad therapist and they feel like they don't have any other options yeah. and they're they're dealing with a therapist who doesn't remember their name, mm. answers phone calls, recommends they get drunk before sex to deal with anxiety, mm. uh, don't show up to appointments, mm. forgotten why they're there. They're putting up with this crap mm-hmm. because we as an industry, a global industry, uh, collectively have not done our job to make it easier for people to be connected with the right people. And mm-hmm. until that changes, it's on us individually as, as, as a collective because the, the database or the referral service just isn't out there. So, you know, and it's not that hard. If we all do our part, it, you know, it's, it's like litter. If we all do our part, then there's a lot less litter on the streets. If we all do our part, then there's a lot more clients getting connected with the right professional. Yeah. All right. Let's let's take a break, Bob. Let's shake this negativity. Shake get, it. And get back uh, to uh, another email. What do you say, Steve? <laughs> 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 All right, ba- all right, Bab. Ba- Bab. I was, gonna, I was gonna call you Babs. Nah, Steve. Steve's good. <laughs> all right, Steve. Uh, it's the we're back from the break, and if people want to become a patron of the podcast, they can do that now. Also, if you want, please like us on Facebook. That's where we do all of our announcements and Instagram. So if you can do that, that would be uh, good uh, for us to be able to connect with you about various different things. For example, we are giving away a new scholarship of $2,000. So if you know someone who is in the mental health field that is getting their master's or doctorate, uh, let them know because uh, we're going to be reviewing those, I think, in August, if I'm not mistaken. And we also are going to give a $1,000 art grant to someone who is of a worthy recipient. So you can go to the website fill out either the scholarship and or the art grant application. And Stacy, my wife, will be reviewing all those uh, to, to give out those, the, that money. Actually, Your artist the, in residence. Yeah, actually the art grant, I think is 1200 now because an yeah. anonymous patron gave 200 bucks 200 to bucks. it. Yeah, I saw that. Um, also, we have a Facebook fan page where there's a lot of different uh, fan interaction with each other, including, People getting together and watching movies and then doing a Zoom chat or reading a book and then doing a Zoom chat. There's a lot of, uh, you know, socializing between the, the, the listeners and the patrons, which I find to just be fantastic. We also have a Discord if you're into that cor- sort of thing uh, with different channels of various different things. What's this Discord? Discord is like, 
it's like a forum if if you remember old forums, but it's it's more like I don't know, it's kind of specific. It, like have you ever seen Slack or Discord, Slack, Discord? Um, no. You kind of have to see it. it. It's it's kind of like Facebook. It's kind of like an ongoing chat, and there's different channels. Like like there's one channel for us that where it's like um, pets. So you go on this channel, and it's just everyone posting pictures of their pets and then saying things, and then you can like someone's post, and you know it's just an ongoing thing. But there's that. Also, know that we do YouTube or I do YouTube live Q and A every Thursday at 2 o'clock, and we alternate between patron only and open to the public. So join us on YouTube live for that. How does that work? Do people, they're on there live and they either call or type in questions to you? Yeah, they type in questions. Jeez. Yeah, it's been pretty interesting. Uh, When it's patron only, it's pretty um, handleable. But when it's open to everyone, I can only get to probably like 3% of the questions that, that they ask, oh. which, which kind of bumps me out. <laughs> um, but, uh, right. but yeah, I do my best. How many, how many listeners when it's open to everybody, roughly, you know? Thousands, yeah. I mean, Jeez Louise, you're yeah. famous. <laughs> I knew when he was not so famous. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mandrock writes in and says, how much of being a good therapist comes from books, from formal education, and or how much is it innate? Some people mm-hmm. tend to understand other people more easily. How much does that matter? Does it make the does it make the difference between good and average as a therapist? What do you think, Bob? Great. It was an interesting question. Do you remember Sandra Lippincott? Yeah. Oh, I loved her. She was great. She was yeah. our uh, ethics teacher, among other things, in graduate school. I remember her saying once, um, education will make a good therapist better but will not make somebody who's not cut out for it any good. Mm. So um, uh, I'm not a reader of books. There are a lot of good books out there, um, but I I don't learn that way. So I don't understand how to learn how to do therapy from reading a book. Um, That said, I I recently bought a copy of uh, Kirk's um, Your Your supervision book and i've been looking through it and do believe that that's a good resource to guide me because that's a direction i'm considering going anyways um so for me though if i want to learn something i usually find a teacher i think that our graduate program was a quick and dirty way to get a license you know Mm -hmm. and that while um i really liked graduate school and i really enjoyed most of the classes we had and uh, learned a lot I think that the bulk of my education has um, taken place by seeking out training postgraduate school. Um, and that's the way I learn is I find somebody to teach me how to do it and, and then um, help me with my um, learning curve. But the books, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't make myself read them. And I also end up interpreting them in um, ways in which they are not intended because they go through the distorted lens of my own insecurities and my own, you know, whatever bias. And you're like criticizing it as you're reading it? Um, more like misapplying it. Oh. Out of, out of um, I tend to be kind of literal. Sorry, let me try that again. I am literal. I miss literal jokes. People make literal jokes with me, and I have a pretty good sense of humor, but I take them seriously, and I'm like, was that a joke? And really? they're like, yeah, that was a Yeah. I don't, yeah. I've never seen you do that. You, yeah, you, yeah, you, I do. You, you understand humor. I do. I understand humor really well, but um, I'm very literal, and I miss stuff. Because I'm literal, I miss nuance. And um, I've never seen that in you at all. Yeah, it's true. And, but it's particularly true with the written word. Oh. With the written word, there's definitely an over. I remember when I was reading the manual for how to do DBT, and my overlay was so far off the mark that I used to think, whatever I think I should do, I should do the opposite, because that's how far off the mark I was. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and the only way I actually learned that was I was taught huh. by um, knowledgeable uh, sound. So do you think you were innately a good therapist before you started? No. Uh, I think I had aptitude 
Yeah. And I, I think I wasn't any good at it. Yeah. I had aptitude and I had, I had a lot of experience being a client. So I, you know, I still do that. I draw from my experience as a client as I um, am in, as a therapist these days. So there's a um, strong link there. But no, I don't think, I think I have aptitude, but no, I needed the training. I, uh, I really needed the training. Well, it's interesting because I knew you back then, and yeah. I would say that you were a good therapist. It's just a matter of what do we mean by good therapist. Well, that's a great point. And, and I think both of us are similar in that. I think we would both agree that we were not very good therapists when we first yeah. started, but no. we helped a lot of people when we first started. So yeah. how, do we, how do we reconcile that? There are certain blind spots, like for me, yes. trauma was a huge blind spot for yeah. me. Um, I don't know, a certain counter-transference awareness might have been a blind yeah, spot. Yeah, totally, know. me, that's me, yeah. Um, just self-confidence. Oh, uh, that's still me. <laughs> being being real and authentic. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I felt like maybe I was I was okay with that in the beginning, but, but I would say that you absolutely had aptitude and an innate skill. You have always been you, and mm -hmm. your... Uh, you -ness is very um, much in line with what can be a good therapist, you know? So what's, what's that word? You -ness? <laughs> you, you, the, the, you, uh, oh, you -ness. the you ness of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you -ness is a name that we don't use anymore. I have a lot of ants, like great ants named Eunice. Eunice. You know, and yeah. uh, we don't hear that name anymore. No. Uh, like Eugene and Eunice. Actually, I think I have an aunt Eugene and aunt Eunice that are married, but anyway. Um, my, those are not my favorite names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just watch, you know, a bunch of hipsters will start naming their kids U Eunice. <laughs> um, so... You know, normally I would answer the question similar to you, Bob, mm -hmm. in that I always say 99% of what I know about therapy and about being a therapist happened after graduate school or mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of education, formal education. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, my formal education did provide me mm -hmm. with a lot and yeah. gave me... Uh, and some of it was terrible. I'll, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. Not everyone was Sandra Lippincott. No. And, and some is of she it, still there? No, no, no. Yeah. She she left soon after we were mm -hmm. we were there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, maybe five ten years. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard for me to know the answer to that question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. will say that a lot of what I am as a therapist has come from outside of graduate school. But it's hard to know what graduate school exactly gave me. Uh, and it's also hard to know how much of it was innate because I would say that for me, I was, b b you know, when Bob, Bob and I met in our very first day of graduate school and mm -hmm. Bob at that point had an innate therapist persona, N not persona fake, but like his humanness, his you-ness, if you will, <laughs> was a good listener, caring, soft voice, mm -hmm. uh, compassionate, questioning of people beating themselves up. You know, you've always had a good radar for like, oh, it sounds like you're beating yourself up. Mm. I was not that way. <laughs> I, I was not that way. People, people, you know, for you, Bob, I'm guessing it was like, yeah, people come to me, you know, even before I was a therapist, they would come to me and and vent about their feelings and this kind of thing. Sometimes. Uh, I, I might have had that maybe, but not nearly to the kind of quintessential sense that you'll see some people will have. I, I was a frat guy, captain of the football team, douchebag, oh. oh. who was in a band and liked to subject other people to his music. And uh, Do you know, the first night we met, that's one of the things that you said. You said, my name's Kirk, because we were introducing ourselves in ProSim with Flora. Oh, really? Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm Kirk. And you know, like every other guy in Seattle, I'm in a band. And, and my first thought was, I'm not in a band. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Am I weird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it, it's just, you know, by a certain age, you realize it's not a special thing. You know, it's... 
it's fun and I'm yeah. I love it, but it's not like something that is um, amazing. It's just interesting that that was a part of my identity back then. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a big part of my identity. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so so I didn't have you know, and people will email me sometimes and they'll say like. I don't feel like I have the innate skills to be a therapist. Should I not be a therapist? And, oh. and and I will often reference myself. I'll be like, I didn't have the innate skills. I didn't know what empathy was. I, I literally just didn't really understand the concept. And when it was taught to me, it took me a while to kind of really wrap my head around it. Now I'm, you know, in the top 1% of understanders of empathy. Yes. Uh, and the top 1%, I would think, of people who can do empathy. So having innate skills uh, definitely gives you a head start, but you don't need those innate skills to, to become an excellent therapist. Uh, contrary, I think, to what Sandra Lippicott was saying. Now, I, I will say that you have to have the drive. I, I think if I was to agree with Sandra Lippicott uh, in terms of you can't make a bad therapist good through graduate school, uh, I would agree that you can't make someone who doesn't want to dedicate themselves to humans. You can't make someone dedicate themselves to humans. You can't make someone dedicate themselves to self-awareness. You know, graduate school isn't going to do that. Um, and so the best therapists are people who are truly dedicated, uh, uh, you know, unconnected to any monetary benefit or any kind of accolade from society. They're truly dedicated to humans to self-awareness, to expanding themselves, to the betterment of the human race and society. It, it just is, they just want to. Mm-hmm. It's not something they, they force themselves to do. They, they wake up in the morning. It's not a chore. It's something that they do because they want to. And, and I think it, if, that's, if there is anything innate about yeah. a good therapist, it's yeah. that. Yeah, I agree. And, and of course, books and formal education can't can't teach you that it can refine it it can inspire yeah. maybe yes. but but like the therapist we talked about in the last section i i wonder how much that person really cares deep down about yeah. the human race and about self-awareness uh, i really wonder about that yeah right. um so that that's what i would say to that um you know that's yeah. one of my favorite things about doing this podcast coming on this podcast with you yeah is um the very consistent reminder about empathy and softness that you are an example of. Huh. Huh. Oh God, I'm feeding the narcissism. Uh, Shit. (laughs) Well, what I was going to say was what I was thinking was, and I didn't want to, sometimes I just like to let you say things, Bob, without stomping all over it. So I was just, I was just kind of letting it breathe. But what popped in my head was, I think it's something about the, you, you're framing it like I'm inspiring you, but the way I would maybe frame it is our conversations inspire each other, you know? Mm, right. That like, makes sense. It's not like before I got on, you know, the the clean feed with you. Right. Uh, that you and I would... Clean feed, by the way, is what we record this through. Um, it's not like I was like, human race, yay, but talking with you yeah. inspires me. Um, oh, and so I... Nice. So I think... I think we inspire each other in that way. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's nice. Hey, speaking of, it reminds me, you know, when I was um, learning DBT and uh, at that clinic learning DBT, one of the things they talked about as they were in training therapists is they would they would give feedback, but not about the therapist behavior in the session. They'd give feedback about the therapist client dyad, which I don't know why that came to me. I guess because of what you just said about building we, you something. And me. Yeah, we're in alchemy. Yeah. of uh, uh, some is perhaps greater than the parts to some degree. Right. Or at least the result of them. Anyways, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Another thing I'm just realizing right now, Bob, is like, you know, Zoom and video conferencing, ha- we're all living that right now. And yeah. you, you and I, were talking, we're, we see each other over Zoom, we're recording ourselves on something else. But even though right now you and I don't have actual eye contact, yeah. I can tell you're looking at my eyes because, you know, you learn over an hour, like, where my eyes must be. 
Right. Even though, and you must kind of know too. I, like, I do. Like if I look over here, you know that I'm not looking at you. I do though, know that. Yeah. Even though right now I'm looking at your eyes, but right. I'm not actually looking at the camera. No. And it just occurred to me, and I wonder if research has come out about this, I'm guessing it will with all the video conferencing, that our brains adjust. Because as you look at my non, at where I think my eyes are, which is actually, you're actually looking at my shoulder, my mm -hmm. right shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, in my heart, in my, my emotional center, am interpreting that as eye contact. Right. And, and, I, and I remember a time when Zoom would drive me crazy because of this disjointed eye contact thing. Or in my head, it's sort of like, I always use this example, when you first start snorkeling, your body doesn't want to breathe underwater. It's like, uh, that doesn't make any sense. It's unnatural. Or the first time you get on a bicycle and you're just going to launch yourself, your body's like, this won't make any sense. But eventually your body becomes used to it and it, you don't mm -hmm. even have to think about it anymore. And right now, my body has become used to the fact that when you look at my sh right shoulder, it feels like eye contact to me. Do you, uh, do you know what I'm saying? I do. I think you're right. That was my big, big bitch about Zoom before all this COVID stuff happened, too, is, oh, sure, we could see each other on Zoom, but we won't make eye contact, and it's going to be disjointed, and disconnected. And it turns out it's not. Yeah. And I think it has mm. to do with, like, your brain yeah. just adjusts right. for... Because it's like after a time, you're just like, oh, mm -hmm. this is what the visual cue of eye contact looks like. And it might even take five minutes to adjust because everyone is sort of looking at a different spot, you know? Right. right. And if and if I move my Zoom screen over here and I look over here, does that feel like no longer eye contact? Well, it would until my brain adjusts. Yeah, because right hey, now I'm about, looking. How about now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking right at the camera. How about now? Is this... <laughs> It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because that was always the thing. It's like, okay, if we're going to have eye contact, we have to have a screen where the the, yeah. the the camera's right in the middle of the screen. Like Star Trek. Remember the video conference in Star Trek? Yeah, and yeah. W which is, you know, possible, but it would yeah. be this blank spot in the middle of your screen. Right. But maybe the other answer is just your brain's just adjust, just adjust. And, and you just get used to it. Like wearing glasses. You, the right. first time you put on glasses, it, it feels right. weird. And then over time you get used to it. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, maybe telehealth uh, will be able to save the day in the end. Maybe. All right, Bob, we... what's the final word on today's episode? Well, before we get to the final word, did we answer the question? Oh, how much of being a good therapist comes from books, formal education, and how much of it is innate? I feel like we answered that question. Okay. Okay. Um, do, some people tend to understand other people more easily. Do, does that matter? Does that matter? Uh, I don't know. I, I've trained a lot of therapists. And let me think. Let me think about that one for a second. Because I, I have therapists that I've trained who do very much seem to understand humans better than others post-grad. And I don't know if it makes them better therapists. So it makes them a different kind of therapist, I would say. So that's what yeah, I say to that one. I mean, how do we define the term, right? It's hard to say because the term is unclear. Well, yeah, but I think I know what, or at least I'm interpreting it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot of trainees and... There are some trainees who, from the first second that I ask them to do something, you know, like a role play or something, mm -hmm. they really just get oh. other people. Yeah. And because it's an intuition, you know, it's right. an intuition of, I bet you this person is feeling bad about X, even though they've probably never even told anyone about that. Right. Even if it's just something like, they feel humiliated or something. You know, the, the, uh, the intuition of when someone's attachment injuries are happening, you have to, you have to understand other people. You have to have mm -hmm. a good intuition. And intuition mm -hmm. meaning not like energy space and crystals. I'm talking about uh, the experience and wisdom you get from interacting with a lot of humans and a lot of self-reflection that makes it so that when someone gives a slight visual cue of an attachment injury 
or the circumstances are likely to produce an attachment injury, mm -hmm. you uh, intuit correctly mm -hmm. that the person is having it without them having to say it. And I, I think that I think that that is something that some people are are a little better at than other people. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that all my trainees, regardless of where they are on that spectrum, uh, tend to be successful therapists and tend to help a lot of people. Yeah. I right. just think it makes them different kinds of therapists. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. Um, and then last question from Mandrock, does it make the diff does it make the difference between good and average? And again, I think we kind of answered that question. Too. Yeah. I think we kind of answered it. Um, and I think the, the thing that I kind of eventually got to, which is that... If you, if the person cares and they're dedicated to yeah. self-awareness and they're dedicated to humans, then they have everything they need to, to become the best therapist on the planet. Oh, that's really nicely put. Because probably you have everything you need to already inside you. Yeah. Right. It's a question of honing. Yeah. And, and I will say that the book learning and the, and the graduate school learning is really the only way to learn things like ethics or professional standards or research methods. There's no way that you're gonna learn that yeah. on your own, or at no. least it's gonna be really hard. Yeah. So there are certain topics, the professional side of our job, which of which there are many, and it's complicated, that you're just not, you're not gonna, one, innately have that. And two, reading a book is not gonna give you that um, know-how. Um, I don't think there's a substitute for graduate school. Yeah, like like I could hire a supervisor, but they're not gonna they're gonna be uh, uh, my agenda driven as opposed to driven by a greater um, knowledge of the things that are useful to know. Uh, boy, that's a, just a no, no. I know what you mean. Yeah, right. Now so I will it, say that as a supervisor, sometimes I set out and just say, okay, today I'm gonna lecture you for a half an hour about thanks. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually write about that in my book about the, the teaching role of mm -hmm. a, a supervisor that that I think is neglected sometimes. Because mm -hmm. the notion that graduate school teaches every supervisee what they need to know is of course absurd. And that uh, supervisors should become good teachers. Like I'm gonna teach you the concept of the working alliance. I'm gonna teach you trauma therapy. I'm gonna teach you the what positive, unconditional positive regard actually is not what you pulled away from a chapter that you read in a book and was told by a terrible instructor about what that means. So let me tell you what unconditional positive regard and what Rogerian therapy actually is. It's actually mm. really deep stuff. It it's extremely deep. complicated, very deep stuff. Yeah. Let me let me teach you that for the next half hour. Uh -huh. And let's revisit that as we go on. You know, I, I think that, and I, you know, I find that uh, supervisees uh, want that kind of stuff. You know, they really yeah. crave it. Yeah. Um, and it reminds me of uh, a lot of supervision trainings are terrible. I'm just going to put it out there. And one of the trainings I went to, it was a large group and, and of, and the, <laughs> I'll try to keep this brief. But so if you're a supervisor, you're kind of at the peak or the pinnacle of the field, right? You're, you're no longer in school. You have the experience. You ha are now given the mantle. And so a supervision training, uh, you know, to, to train supervisors, it, it has a lot of potential for people to be concerned about how they're coming across to other people. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and so I don't know if that was just me. I'm certainly, I'm certainly I, I was contributing to it, but it felt like the vibe in the room of these 30 people, there was just a lot of, uh, self, uh, just a lot of self-consciousness, you know, of like, okay, I, I'm supposed to be, I, these are a bunch of supervisors and I have to act like I'm a supervisor too, that kind of thing. And one of the major questions that the trainers put out to everyone in a discussion format, which I thought was a mistake, is um, sh how much supervision should be directive versus how much should it be led by the supervisee? You know, how much do you set the agenda? How much do you route the conversation versus how much uh, should the supervisee? Or when a supervisee has something that they need to learn, how, how much should you just tell them what they need to learn versus should they come to their own realization themselves? So 
just what's your general answer to that? If if I were to, if you were a participant in this group and you were to raise your hand and say, "Well, I think," what what would you say to that? I would say um, I would want to be more directive if I believed that my supervisee's behavior was putting a client in harm's way. Yeah, and Socratic, if not. Socratic meaning to people who don't know, you ask a bunch of questions, questions to lead somebody. You know, leading, but you know, also you're not really quite sure where it's leading. But you just, mm-hmm. you, you know, you might say something like, "Well, uh, is that a dual relation?" You know, you, you as a supervisee, supervisor, you might say to your supervisee, "Well, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think what you're engaging in is an unethical relationship?" And you just ask a bunch of questions uh, with the giving the supervisee space to figure it out for themselves. No, I, I think I'd want to be more directive. Right, right. Of course, in my, I'm, I agree with you. And mm-hmm. m- supervisees agree too. When I ask them, I'm because I, I, over time, because I've become insecure about this earlier on, I would ask supervisees, I would be like, so often I'll just tell you what the right answer is because I know the right answer and frankly, you don't. <laughs> and so I'm going to tell you the answer. Plus, I'm your supervisor, and I'm in control of your practice. So you're going to do what I tell you to do. It. Yeah, I'm going to I, I'm going to do what you're going to do what I tell you to do because if you do something wrong, I'm going to get sued too. Yeah. And if yeah. I don't tell you the right thing, that's on me. So yeah. there are many times I'm just going to tell you that what you're going to do. And is that bad? Do, do you you know do you like that style? And universally, everyone's just like, no, I want that. I yeah. I, how could I come up with the answer myself? I, I don't remember everything I was taught, or maybe I wasn't mm-hmm. taught it. Yes, please just, I just want to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. Now, obviously, that's not in all situations, but mm-hmm. there are situations where that's true. And, but in this training, it, it was a lot of, you know, uh, the the main voice that was heard in the room was, you would never tell a supervisee, what to do. You would always lead them down the path of helping them to figure it out for themselves, which one is true for therapy, right? And so we don't want to confuse supervision with therapy. Mm. Um, And I think a lot of these people, because they're therapists first or something. Uh, Right. And also it sounds paternalistic to just tell people what to do, right? It sounds like you're a fascist and right. that never goes over well as particularly in therapy, particularly in Seattle to just be like, no supervisees are dumb and they need to be told what to do. <laughs> uh, they're not dumb, but I'm just saying yeah. they don't know anything yet because they, they haven't been given a chance to know anything yet. And so there's just a lot of things that they wish to be told, by the yeah. way, they're just like, please don't beat around the bush. Just tell me. Right. Uh, I, and especially the people who are paying me money post-grad, they're just like, I'm paying you a lot of money. I don't want you to Socratically, just tell me the answer. And if we want to have a debate, then we'll have a debate, but just tell me what's on your brain. You know. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, you can say it tentatively and you could explore for sure. But anyway, um, why did I start asking you about that one? Oh, uh, <laughs> boy, I, something about the question that the person wrote in for, but uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I might be a little bit lost. Yeah. Usually you can pull me out of this, but we'll just say it's an unrelated topic that had nothing to do with it. All right, Bob. Uh, <laughs> I, man, I guess that was the final word. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself and, you know, ride the line between fascism and, and Socrates because... You deserve to. Mm-hmm. <laughs>